Uh, we will wait for a few more minutes uh, to let everybody in. And we are welcoming you at the, our EFB webinar, Do's and Don'ts for Green Walls. Uh, you can see the presentation, I hope, and the slide. Uh, just write us plus if you see us and presentation, so we check everything works fine. Hi, so nice to see that so many of you can join us today. Uh, just for your information, uh, I tell you that meeting is recorded. You are not visible at the meeting. You will see only presenters and the presentation. So then uh, you can rewatch this uh, webinar again if you miss something or connection was bad or something else. Uh, so don't worry. Welcome. Uh, we are happy to see that so many people from all over the world joining us today. I know that most of you are from European countries and already working in the field. And uh, we hope that this webinar will be useful for you. Welcome. So few, few more minutes to wait. Maybe. While we are waiting, I can share a video with you about the World Green Infrastructure Congress, in, which will happen in Berlin in June. So you feel a bit inspired about the big event. I will open the video. It will play on the background while we are uh, connecting to the media meeting. Hello. Uh, yes, I, I hope uh, everybody saw the video and a lot of people uh, are already here, so we can start our presentation. I will share the first slide of my presentation again so you can see it. Welcome to the EFB webinar, Do's and Don'ts for Green Walls, Best Practices and Learning from Mistakes. Uh, Today, we continue with EFB series of webinars, which we started because our aim is to promote the uh, greening of the cities around the Europe and around the world. Uh, I will present you shortly EFB, 
EFB is a federation of green roofs and living coal associations. This is the umbrella organization for all. Uh, do you see my presentation? Sorry, I because I'm not sure I'm presenting it now. Can you please write in chat or maybe Katerina, can you please tell me is my presentation visible because it's still playing with this? Sorry, I'm a bit lost. Uh, Katerina, can you please unmute your mic and tell me if the presentation is visible or not? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Uh, yes, today uh, we will present you the best practices of uh, living walls and uh, green roofs. And this webinar is open for you thanks to our sponsor support. You can see on the slide that this webinar is supported by five companies. Wall Green, Vertnis by Novitnis, Karstal, Jakob Probe Systems and Dachgrün. And we are very grateful to our two amazing speakers who agreed to join us today and to share their rich experience. And I will tell about them later, but first I will introduce you, EFB. EFB, uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> EFB is an umbrella organization for all national green roof and living wall associations around Europe. Now we have 16 members in uh, our federation. Only national associations can become our members and you as working experts, specialists in your countries can keep contact with your national associations and uh, participate in their activities. And uh, if they are connected to us, you will also benefit from being part of our network. Uh, I will send you links in the chat in a few minutes. And this, uh, there are the links to our LinkedIn uh, page, uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel. And you will stay updated if you subscribe to us. You will see the news, new webinars, new events, which we organize or help to promote. I will introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, first of all, this is Gary Grant from Great Britain. Uh, he is a director of the Green Infrastructure Consultancy, which works on policy, planning, design, implementation and management of green infrastructure. Uh, Gary's first green wall was the Westfield Shopping Center in London in 2008. And since then, he designed more green walls. And Gary is the lead author of National England's recently published Green Infrastructure Guidance. Uh, for this seminar, Gary will consider the how, what and why principles of creating green walls and the do's and don'ts, including some case studies. And also we welcome here Stefan Zeller from Germany. He is consultant with the German Building Greening Association book, and he focuses on publicly funded programs, training and lecturing. Stefan has worked in the urban greening industry since 2003. And in this webinar, Stefan will show us different types of facet greening. The, we will discuss important planning principles. He will also explain how to avoid common mistakes. And we will continue with Q&A session and you will be able to ask all the questions you are interested in. So please, uh, while the webinar is on and our speakers are speaking, you can write down your questions in chat and we will collect them and we will try to answer all of them or most of them in the end of the webinar. Um, so thank you very much. I uh, stop sharing my presentation. I welcome Gary Grant as a presenter, first presenter today. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana. I will find my presentation, just bear with me. Thank you. So hopefully you can see the presentations. Yes, we see it. Good, good. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Both. Good, good. So uh, I have about 20 minutes. Um, I don't want to focus too much on on failures, but of course it's, it's important that we learn from failures. Um, 
I think, of course, we have to be uh, we have to be careful uh, when we're describing failures to understand the real reasons for it. But anyway, uh, in this presentation, I'm sure we'll be be able to think about the do's and don'ts. I'm using the prism of the principles for green infrastructure planning and design, which were launched uh, by Natural England a couple of weeks ago. And I just find that quite a useful way of presenting the information. Um, of course, we've got other experts with us today, Stefan in particular. So of course, we'll do our best to answer any questions you have, and I believe there will be uh, time for questions. Um, if there are any difficult questions, I'll hand them over to Stefan. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure we'll both get our share. So the, the Natural England's green infrastructure principles um, really are, are, are in three groups of five, the what, why and how. And I just thought it would be very useful for people to know about these principles um, and then to relate them to a number of projects and examples that I have here to show you for the next 20 minutes or so. Or so. so the principles uh, include the what, the why and the how principles. Uh, the why principles are that we need to make, uh, we need to do things for biodiversity, for nature, uh, to make beautiful places. Of course, beauty is often on the agenda with green walls, um, but sometimes biodiversity is not on the agenda. So that's something that's very important and, and something that's often been overlooked. Uh, we're increasingly aware of the importance of green infrastructure for active and healthy places. Of course, we want to prosper, and there are some good examples of how green walls help with that. Um, water management is increasingly important nowadays. Uh, of course, that's related to climate change and our resilience. So those are, if you like, the why reasons. So I'm going to. Um, I'm just going to look at a, a few case studies. Um, now, this is uh, the City Hall of um, Southampton in the south of England, and the client here was Southampton City Council. And uh, the ecologist um, for Southampton City Council, excuse me, the ecologist for Southampton City Council had been with with me on trips to uh, to Basel to look at uh, what they were doing there in terms of green infrastructure for invertebrates, insects and so on. And so her brief was um, that there really should be planting which were attracted insects. So here's an example. It's a south facing green wall, an example of how it can be beautiful, but it can be uh, important for biodiversity. Um, and of course, we have the uh, uh, the industry in England now to provide that. In the south of England, we've got companies, including um, A and S, who I think are on this call today, um, who who can actually uh, can actually address that kind of agenda. Now, um, this this wall is over 150 years old. It's on the south coast of England in Brighton, and uh, it's very much associated with uh, promenading, uh, the seaside, an active and healthy place. Uh, but I, you know, I, I include it because there are so many lessons that we can learn from this because it's something that's 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 lasted. Uh, the main species you, in that is uh, Japanese spindle, Euonymus, uh, which uh, has grown much larger than perhaps the textbooks uh, suggest. Um, and there's problems now because the the, the infrastructure, the grey infrastructure behind this needs repair. And of course, the engineers wanted to destroy the wall in order to repair the infrastructure. So. We've been working with the city authorities to find ways of repairing in sections which don't involve destroying the wall. But the other interesting thing about this is that over the 150 years, 
many hundreds of other species have colonized this wall. So it makes it and it's it makes it very, very interesting. And there's there's a, a good film about the the Great Green Wall of Brighton, uh, which you can uh, search for and have a look at if you want to find out more about that. And this is part of that same wall, which is outside of the uh, the boardwalk. So some of it's underneath decking and some of it is in the open air. Now, uh, uh, as as Tetiana mentioned, that the first wall that I was involved with was in 2008, 2009. And uh, uh, again, uh, ANS, who are on the call today, were were the contractors for this, I believe. And, you know, this was interesting because it was due to open at the time of the huge economic collapse, the financial collapse in 2009. And the, the new um, restaurants and the new shops were very worried that they wouldn't be let, you know, the, the landlord was very worried that they wouldn't be able to let those shops. And because the green wall, which is actually a noise barrier, there are, there are homes behind there, so it's double sided and it's primarily a noise barrier. But because that wall was so attractive, the the uh, landlords, the uh, the owners of the building uh, told me that this was a factor in, in the success. So so the, the, there's a lesson to be learned there about uh, the, the economic benefits. Now, uh, in 2012, when uh, I worked on the Rubens at the Hotel Living Wall, there'd been criticism uh, that green walls use use uh, drinking water, potable water, as we call it. And people would argue this is a waste of water. Um, you shouldn't you shouldn't be irrigating with 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 water, which is drinking water. So what we did on that project was to collect rainwater from the roof and that's stored in this tank. This tank is on the first floor and then that water is pumped to the roof of the building where it's then distributed through the irrigation system to the green wall. So this is a, a very wise use of water. Uh, but it's also uh, interesting because uh, these tanks can be programmed to empty in advance of storms. So you have a, a method of, of reducing flood in the streets by storing water in tanks. If you empty that tank before the storm, you can have software that's connected to the weather forecast. You empty the tank, then you close it again. It's empty and then it fills uh, as the storm progresses. So. Um, very interesting software that you can use with rainwater harvesting now. Now, uh, a few years on from that, um, th there were further criticisms. Um, they said, well, with the with with projects, with many projects, it's too complicated. You have too many, too much uh, electrical equipment, pumps and so on. Uh, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but this is a vertical rain garden that uh, that that's passive. So the idea is that water comes from the roof instead of going into the drains uh, where it can cause flooding in a storm. It goes into tanks behind uh, the green wall and then that water is wicked through um, into the growing medium. So the, the plants are irrigated. Uh, without pumps and, and so on. And this was a very successful project um, and it was tripled in size and it's still there. So it's a few years old. And for those people who are technical, um, the idea is you can see on the left there, there's a section. So water can go into tanks sequentially from down pipes. Each tank can fill up and then that can wick through into the planters. And there's quite a lot of examples now of wicking technology and tanks being used um, to to make green walls without uh, irrigation systems. And, and I predict that we'll see a lot more of that in the future. Now, the fifth of the uh, why, um, uh, the why principles is uh, resilient climate positive places, climate change adaptation, if you like, and overheating in um, in summer can be very very dangerous. People, elderly people, trapped in apartments in heat waves, 
uh, without air conditioning can die. And green walls can be used to save lives in this way. So uh, you'll see a thermal image um, of a uh, biotexture wall in uh, London, in Southampton Row. And you can see it's taken a, a very hot day in the middle of summer and the conventional uh, facade wall is has places that are 40 degrees, 50 degrees centigrade, but the green wall is at ambient temperature. And this is because of the evaporative cooling that you get from green walls. So you can see that green walls, a good, another good reason to have a green wall is to cool buildings. And this is another another factor, perhaps, which is occasionally overlooked. So we we need to think about that when we're planning and designing green walls. So uh, what you know, what what kind of green infrastructure do we need? Well, we've already covered some of these points in a way, but sometimes there's no harm in repetition to to make sure that the message gets there. So we have multifunctionality as a major uh, a major feature variety. We want to connect together green infrastructure. We want it to be accessible to people and we want to respond to local character. So multifunctionality um, is something that's overlooked because of the way that society is organized with departments and with pro professions and people only concerned with one thing and budgets which tend to be for one thing. So it's really important that we remind each other that we need to think about the why um, principles of green infrastructure and, and constantly remind ourselves about issues like biodiversity and ecology, which get forgotten, community engagement, uh, wise use of water and so on. And, you know, variety is important. So, of course, today we're talking about uh, green walls, living walls, but the, the whole spectrum of green infrastructure needs to involve a range of different interventions. Sometimes a green wall is not necessarily the best way of spending our money. We have to admit that. Um, and of course, we have to think about how these things work together. And also we need to look for variety within the category of green walls as well. Uh, so. Uh, not every wall should be the same, so we should get away from the idea of, of always providing the same technology with the same planting in, in the same way. It needs to be varied and it needs to respond to location, to aspect. Is it south facing? Is it north facing? What, what are the wind patterns like and so on? Is it near the sea? Is it a particularly cold region, particularly hot region? So there's lots of variety that comes out of that understanding. So we want to build an ecological network. Now that network may also be uh, important for people because sometimes uh, traffic free means of getting around walking, cycling. In fact, even traffic can, can be a green part of a green network. And that's a ground level, if you like. But cities are three dimensional and we need to uh, remember that uh, some wildlife doesn't need to move along the ground. It can hop, if you like, from from uh, st it can move along stepping stones. And I think green walls can be stepping stones. So, for instance, if you have a something like a butterfly, which moves relatively small distances, perhaps from one feature to another, green walls could could uh, form part of that stepping stone corridor. So again, this is important. It's about understanding the needs of people and the needs of different species of wildlife as well. So accessibility is important. Uh, we've already heard about the Westfield Wall there in the lower part. Um, but you know, even if it's a lower tech uh, wall uh, made from climbing plants, it can be part of the public realm somewhere which is readily accessed. And the, the example there, um, it, actually the label is incorrect. The, the example there with the climbing plants is in Basel. It's a shopping, it's the Stucki shopping centre in Basel. It's not social housing near Tower Bridge. Sorry about that cut and paste uh, glitch there in the matrix. And then finally, in, in these, um, these um, uh, what uh, categories, principles, it, it, 
it's about responding to an area's character. And, you know, this is uh, an old building. Um, the um, the climbing plants, the wisteria has been there for a long time, of course. Um, and there is a, a tradition of climbing plants on historic buildings. You have a uh, hedera helix, you have wisteria, there are other species, clematis and so on. And, uh, you know, this is traditional. It, it provides you the same benefits uh, that some other more intensive uh, styles of, of greening provide. And so, you know, this is this is very important that we match the techniques and the species to the setting. So how how do we uh, uh, go about this? Um, so we've got five principles on how we go about this. We need to have a vision. Why are we doing this? Uh, we need evidence and, and technical methods of understanding um, how we're going to do it. Um, we we need to plan strategically. We've already talked about corridors there, but there may be other considerations. It might be part of a plan to green a city or a precinct. And so a green wall might be something that's uh, a lighthouse project, if you like, that, that's showing the way. Um, we, we want to create places. Place making is a term that you hear urban designers talk about. So the green walls can be an important part of that. And we need to manage this, the, these features, look after them, evaluate them. So uh, creating a, a vision is important. So um, the Rubens at the Palace Hotel Green Wall um, was part of a vision, uh, a partnership between the Westminster City Council and the Business Improvement District and building owners and businesses and uh, NGOs in that part of London. They were saying we want to really understand what we can do. Now, this is a, an area where there's very limited space at ground level for greening. There's no room for any parks. It's the middle of London. Um, there's there's very little room in the pavements for trees, although, of course, we would put trees in wherever we could. So we're looking at green roofs and even with green roofs there, sometimes that's not so easy. So this uh, older building, for for example, it wasn't possible. Uh, this is a hundred year old building. It wasn't possible to green the roof, uh, but it was possible um, to green the wall. And so this was uh, part of the vision. It showed what was possible and it inspired others to to do similar things as well. And of course, we want to analyze the cities that we're in. We want to map them. We want to plot what's already there. We want to see what could be included. Um, so it's very important that that we we do this analysis so that we're spending our money wisely and we're we're making our intervention strategically in order to to reduce flood, to reduce overheating, to make those ecological networks that we spoke about. And you know, there's some there's a lot of software now that's available. So the EnviMet engine, that's E N V I hyphen M E T, the Envi, Envi, EnviMet engine, which is uh, uh, very impressive, is used, for example in uh, the Green Pass uh, software. And this can test projects. It can look at pro problems that would occur with, with wind fields, with overheating, with flooding, uh, with carbon, um, uh, using carbon and sequestering carbon, all sorts of uh, um, uh, information and, and test schemes and, and show where green walls can be most effectively used. So um, it's it's very important that we we keep up to date with this kind of analysis. So uh, strategies, as I say, are important. We worked on a green infrastructure strategy for Swansea, which is a city in Wales, and uh, the council have their ideas about where greening could be concentrated. Um, joining together existing parks or where there are development proposals where we can write a brief uh, for those who are planning and designing and giving permission for new development and, and remind them we have a potential here for a new um, 
feature or features. And although this Dragon Hotel project, which is still in planning, it's uh, likely to be installed this year. Um, although this wasn't within the heart of the of the uh, the green network, it was very close by. So it what it meant was uh, it, there was still an influence from the strategic plan. Um, if you like, there's a, there's a green arrow pointing at that hotel. So uh, planning strategically is important for those areas that are identified, but it can also help people uh, uh, to perhaps be more creative or to inspire people who might be looking at neighbouring areas, which is the case here. And of course, we can really revitalise and create special places uh, with with green walls. And, uh, you know, if you're talking about green walls, you have to uh, acknowledge the great work that's been done by Patrick Blanc. Um, the, the wall at Quai Branly, which you can see on the right there, was one of the first ones that I saw um, nearly 20 years ago in Paris, which completely transformed what would otherwise have been a very ordinary building. So you're creating a, a, a destination. People are really uh, enjoying that. And of course, since then, there have been many places which have really been enhanced considerably by by the flamboyant approach that you see, for instance, on the Athenaeum Hotel. And then finally, uh, we need to remember that these features uh, need to be maintained and probably one of the biggest failure or some of the most common failures that we see are insufficient maintenance budgets, failure to fix problems when they occur, uh, we've had cases where contracts have been um, terminated because of uh, poor maintenance, but then they've not been renewed in good time. And so if you delay that uh, uh, appointment of a new maintenance contractor, then you can have problems that occur and are not attended to. So maintenance is probably one of the biggest problems that we have. Um, Nowadays, the software that can monitor, for instance, um, irrigation and messages can be sent to managers on their phones so that they're alerted at an early stage. But it's also important that we think about the access to uh, green walls. So, of course, nowadays we've got lots of uh, useful equipment like uh, mobile uh, working platforms, which we can bring in there, scissor lifts, uh, modern New buildings often have building management units, of course, which can be used for this. Uh, but sometimes we have to be a little bit more creative. So this is a case where it was very difficult to get uh, equipment. It's an old building. So this is a um, an access system that's that's put together on the pavement from a kit. And then the um, uh, the hoists are installed for the day. Uh, they're carried to the roof. So, you know, there, there are ways of dealing with even tricky situations. It's not ideal, um, but it's, of course, I, in a perfect world, we would have easy access, safe access, uh, which is considered right from the beginning of the uh, project. And of course, we want to monitor, we want to photograph, we want our maintenance engineers to be keeping good records and making those available. And we, we want more and more scientists to be measuring the performance of these walls, the thermal performance, uh, the, the species that are colonizing them and so on. So uh, we're probably not doing nearly enough. And of course, it's mostly good news uh, when we do investigate these things. We're finding a lot of benefits and we're learning more about the various species that we're able to use in green walls, which is growing. The list is growing and growing. So I think I've taken my 20 minutes, so I'm going to hand back. Um, I'm going to hand back now to Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you for your presentation. And Stefan is here. <laughs> thank you, Gary. Thank you, Tatiana. Can you all hear me well? Uh, yes, we hear you well. Great. 
So I'm just now sharing my presentation, which should be in this one. So Tatiana, can yes, you Yes, great. We see the slide with the speakers. So yeah, perfect, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, Gary, thanks for um, your very interesting um, uh, presentation to uh, give us an overview of the how, what and why um, aspects, um, which I liked very much. Um, in my presentation, in the next 20 minutes, um, I will uh, mainly focus on the question how. So how do we do um, the green walls? How do we get them right to avoid failures and uh, mistakes? And um, before I hop on to the next slide, um, I also um, wanted to mention that uh, one of my colleagues, Felix, is also with us today. He's also um, has a deep knowledge in green walls and green facades, and he will be able, um, uh, alongside Gary and myself, later on to answer questions um, if you have some. So, um, yeah, let's uh, start right away. What I will do in the next couple of minutes is uh, I'm uh, showing you, um, giving you a brief overview of the different types of facade greeting, greening. So it's getting a little, um, but I'm not going too deep into that. Uh, obviously, that would be too much for a 20 minute presentation. I will then uh, talk about uh, some basic planning uh, principles. So what do we have to think about um, to get it right? And then um, the last part will be, I call it common mistakes. So these are some some of the mistakes, some of the things we see from time to time and we know they are available. So um, they are avoidable. So in order to avoid these mistakes, um, it's Good to know about them. Uh, looking at different uh, types of uh, green walls or facade greeting, uh, greening, um, we can generally distinguish between uh, ground bound systems and so called wall bound systems. Um, ground bound systems uh, are uh, green walls where the plants they grow into the ground which might be natural ground or um, uh, artificial ground uh, but basically the plants uh, are connected to the ground um, they help themselves with uh, water and nutrients um, so it's a more if you want so it's a more natural way of, of, of growing plants while the wall bound systems, uh, they are mounted to the wall, to the facade. They are not connected to the natural ground. Um, uh, we will look into that later in a bit more detail, um, but they are independent. You can basically place them anywhere um, as long as you feed them with water and uh, nutrients. And going a little bit deeper into that, um, uh, Looking at the ground bound systems, uh, again, we can distinguish between the so called self climbers or self climbing plants and um, the scaffold climbers. I have to be very honest with you, I'm not 100% sure whether scaffold climbers is the right translation into English. Uh, what it means is self climbing plants, they don't need any climbing aids. So um, if you um, uh, use, for example, a heterix plant, you, you plant them into the ground and they um, they grow up the building um, on on the wall. Uh, they don't need any climbing aid or a climbing grid. While uh, what I call a scaffold climber are plants that need um, uh, they need something to to grow up uh, on um, to uh, on the building. Uh, that could be um, steel ropes. It could be a steel grid. Uh, it could be um, some other uh, structure. Uh, to help them growing up the building. The wall bound systems, um, again, we have two types of, of wall bound uh, systems. Uh, we call it horizontal greening systems that are uh, basically um, planter systems that are uh, placed in front of the, the, the wall or in front of the facade. And from these planters, um, like on the picture here, uh, from these planters, they grow up. Uh, and then on the next level, um, uh, again, we have a row of planters. 
Um, and then last but not least, uh, what we call vertical greening. These are um, panels that are fixed on the wall and uh, where the plants sit in these panels. Uh, let's have a brief look on uh, these systems, uh, what they do and how they work. Um, uh, the self climbers, as I said, they don't need a climbing aid. Um, they are planted into the ground. Uh, they need relatively little care and maintenance. Um, so they are relatively easy to build, um, but it's important to grow them only on walls without any joints or holes. Again, we will look into that later in a bit more detail. We have um, wall greening where we use so-called climbing aids. Um, again, they are um, they, they need a bit more maintenance than um, the system or the um, the types of greening I mentioned before. Um, these systems are really um, very nice to um, to support architecture. Uh, gives you a bit more possibilities in in creating. Um, a very nice um, uh, wall and you have a bit more influence on uh, when it comes to uh, the optical effect. Uh, they can be used on almost all um, types of wall constructions. The um, horizontal systems or shelf design, shelf systems, how we sometimes call them. Um, they have no ground contact, as you can see on that picture. Uh, planters are placed uh, in front of, of the facade from where they uh, grow up uh, along alongside the uh, climbing aids. Um, as a vegetation, you can use a perennial, small shrubs and climbing plants. So it, it's not necessarily um, only climbers that we can use on these systems. Um, and obviously, um, there is a bit of weight involved, so uh, the statics have to be suitable uh, to take on the load of these planters, uh, and they can be, um, yeah, they can be um, fixed in front of the wall, or sometimes they are used with uh, what I would call a mounted facade, where you have uh, in front of the original facade, you have a, a structure that takes the load of these planters. The wall bound um, uh, vertical systems um, are panels, uh, sometimes pre planted or uh, planted when they're installed. Um, they need um, more maintenance, more ma care and maintenance than, than the other systems because they really rely on irrigation. Um, so they need constant um, irrigation and, and uh, supply of nutrients. Uh, because they are not connected to the ground and um, they only would survive a couple of days on a hot summer uh, in a hot summer period without um, irrigation. So they are a bit more technical, uh, but they can be used on almost all wall constructions and um, you can create really great pictures on the walls with these um, systems. Now, when we design and um, plan such walls, um, the first thing or one of the first questions is uh, what's the aim? What do we want to achieve? So um, one client might say, well, I want it green, but it should be low maintenance or uh, cost is a main, uh, um, is a main issue. Um, in another case, you might want to use a certain plant. So if you want to use this certain plant species, you have to make sure your wall system and your climbing system is suitable for the plant because um, different plants uh, need different uh, systems to climb on. You might aim to achieve a certain uh, usage or a certain um, function, for example, shadowing the building or uh, um, uh, you want to um, try to evaporate uh, as much as water as possible or something like that. So again, um, you have to make sure the whole system uh, is um, adapted to that. And uh, sometimes we simply have specifications in our development plans, which means um, you have to fulfill some minimum criteria from uh, from the development plan. And all this uh, must um, 
must influence your, your planning and design of your system. Now, what's uh, the uh, general, um, some of the general uh, planning principles? We need to make sure um, the wall construction and the wall composition and the statics are okay for a green wall system. We have to uh, take into account possible wind loads depending on how the building is exposed to the wind. Um, we need to make sure there is water connection uh, if an irrigation system is needed. Um, and we need to make sure that um, for, um, for maintenance, uh, work safety and uh, uh, safe access to the facade is, uh, is made sure. Uh, we need a really good coordination with other trades to make sure uh, all the different systems fit in nicely. Um, and uh, sometimes fire protection might be uh, a point to consider. And uh, at the end, uh, that would lead to a suitable facade greening system and plant selection. In this overview, um, you can see that uh, the different types of systems have uh, different requirements for uh, for building construction. Uh, just to make an example, most of the self-climbing plants, they would need a very solid wall construction with, with no holes, with no, um, um, with no um, uh, joints uh, where they could grow in. Um, modular systems or panel systems, for example, they have relatively high loads, which means you need adequate statics uh, of your wall. Um, so yeah, that gives you a bit of an overview what the requirements for the building construction and technology are. Well, um, when we talk about green walls or green facades, we should obviously focus on the plants and uh, their uh, growth habit. Um, so we need to make sure that the plant size or the plant growth fits with the building we want to green. Um, so every plant has a natural growth height that they want to uh, achieve. So some plants, they won't grow more than two, three meters up, while others try to achieve uh, 10, 20 meters or more. And that needs to fit uh, uh, with the building we want to green. It doesn't make any sense to um, to to plant a high growing um, uh, clematis in front of a little garage, um, because it will just simply uh, grow too strong. Another very interesting um, uh, question is uh, what's the growth habit, how I would call it. So some of the uh, plants we are using, they are uh, rather growing what I call V-shaped. So others are uh, trying to, to grow or you can grow them horizontally uh, to, to green an entire wall and others will simply grow upwards vertically. So again, uh, the growth habit of the plant needs to fit uh, the building. Now, let's have a look at these um, uh, do's and don'ts. And I'm now showing you a few of the don'ts. Um, so what we see here is a very, very simple uh, mistake, but I have to show it because you, uh, you actually see it from time to time. A uh, very nice climbing system installed on this wall. Um, they simply forgot to plant the, the right plants because there are no climbing plants uh, in these planters. So there's no, no use installing a climbing aid. Um, that is a, a mistake that is easily to avoid. Now, a very, very common mistake is uh, the use of uh, these um, self climbers um, that grow alongside these walls, which looks very nicely, I have to say. But um, um, especially with lack of care uh, and the fact that these plants, they grow away from light. So the roots will always uh, try to grow into these little gaps and holes. And as they grow thicker, um, they will at some point damage uh, the facade and the structure. Um, so um, on these types of walls, um, I would not recommend to use any of these self climbers. Uh, same issue here. So you can see on the left hand side, uh, they grow into these gaps and um, create uh, damaged walls. 
Another issue is um, once they have grown up and uh, the building owner decides that it's not the right plant for this wall, uh, many uh, sometimes they try to to remove it, um, but you you won't manage to re remove the entire plant from these walls. So um, because these um, the adhesive plant shoots or roots, they remain on the wall and it's really difficult to get them off the wall. Um, some would suggest to to flame them, uh, which I wouldn't suggest because there is certain certain risk uh, to use fire here. Um, so sometimes you can try to repaint the wall um, to refurbish the facade, but it's uh, that's a very difficult issue, um, and uh, that's why we shouldn't use any self climbers on on these types of walls. Generally speaking, we can uh, install green walls in front of almost any type of facade. What we should need to know, or what we need to be aware of is that, um, for example, on a wooden structure, like on the photograph here on the left side, um, if you grow plants directly on this wooden structure, um, you will always have moisture uh, on, on the uh, facade. Uh, and that means um, that uh, mold could be a problem, that the wood won't dry out uh, from time to time as it should. Uh, so that will be uh, damaged. So if you want to, to put a green system in front of a wooden facade, you should always work with, um, with climbing aids, which keeps a distance between the plants and the wood to make sure there is air ventilation uh, to dry out the wood from time to time and make sure it's, uh, it's not damaged. Another uh, mistake we do see from time to time is that, um, like on this example here, a uh, very nice idea. There was obviously not enough space to for a planting uh, bed here in front of the wall uh, because they need this uh, space for uh, for the pedestrian walkway, which is fine. Um, Again here, the, the plant obviously didn't uh, read the textbook uh, and uh, wasn't uh, aware it should grow around the corner to, gre to green that part of the wall. So um, if, you, uh, if you want to do that, uh, you need to use suitable plants who have also horizontal growing um, and you need uh, the, the right um, cable system to lead them along uh, this direction to make sure they grow where you want them to grow. Basically, same example here, same story, um, a very nice green wall, but um, the plants just didn't grow around the corner. So this is basically wrong um, plant selection, which can be avoided easily. Um, yeah, I find this one quite impressive, uh, I have to say. Uh, a huge wall which was aimed to 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 be green, um, but um, the, the plants just managed to to cover uh, this huge area because there's not enough um, uh, planting area uh, where where it should be to make sure this wall can be green. Um, so again, um, the, the the greening system didn't fit uh, the plant selection or the other way around. Um, sometimes you see these, what I would call a protective grill, um, and um, you know when you plant it, um, uh, the the plants are uh, nice and small and, and little, uh, but over the years, uh, like here um, uh, on this example, they get thicker and thicker. Um, so you need to make sure if you have these structures to make them big enough uh, to allow um, the, the growth of the plants um, or use a different type of plant if there's not enough space, which is a weak growing plant. Or, and also um, maybe uh, we have to ask whether the, uh, the protection grid is necessary at all or whether we could just leave the plant without it. Uh, to make sure uh, the plant is not uh, damaged. 
Now here on the, uh, this is a quite interesting one on the photo on the right side. Um, I found it quite impressive because you see actually, you know, how um, how much volume these roots actually need. And uh, I mean, this planter was fully packed with, with roots. So um, you can imagine that um, uh, planters um, that are big enough to allow enough root space for the plants, that this is uh, very critical when you use uh, planter systems. Now, what we here see is um, a plant species use that um, obviously is aiming to, to grow up uh, rather high. Um, and as it's a small building, um, it's it's already growing over the roof edge uh, rather than greening the wall itself. So um, basically uh, the wall or the greening system doesn't really allow this plant um, to grow appropriately how it naturally would. Um, there is uh, damages to the roof edge are, are possibly or very likely with the plants growing in. So um, on that one here, we should have used plants with a weaker growth, um, so lower gro growing plants, and also um, horizontal lines on the wall to lead the plant growth and appropriate um, care and maintenance uh, would, would help in this situation. Now, looking at um, uh, a panel system, so a green wall system that is mounted to the wall, what we see here very often is um, that um, there is not enough rear ventilation between the panel and the wall. So you need some distance between the panel and the wall to make sure there is ventilation to avoid uh, fungal or mold growth. Um, also, um, you need to make sure that the anchors and brackets to fix the panels are suitable for the system so that there's no movement in that uh, in order to avoid any uh, damage to coatings or insulation or plaster. And obviously, you need a suitable waterproofing uh, layer uh, on the backside to make sure that the building structure um, is not uh, uh, penetrated with uh, with moisture. Um, on these uh, panel systems, um, as I mentioned before, as they do rely on uh, irrigation systems, uh, a failure of the irrigation system uh, can uh, um, yeah can lead to to the plants drying out very quickly. So um, monitoring the irrigation system is very critical in order to make sure um, there is no, no failure with the plants. Now, um, I think I have shown you enough um, mistakes and, and, and bad examples, <laughs> if I can say so. Uh, so to close my presentation, I really would like to, to show you, um, you know, how you, how you get it right and how it can look uh, 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 if it's done rightly. Um, you can see here different um, systems uh, where, for example, on, on uh, top left, um, where plants were used that are, um, uh, they are covering the whole area of the wall when you use uh, appropriate climbing aid like that metal grid here. Um, while on the bottom left, um, we have a systems where we use um, vertical lines where the plants grow up vertically. So it uh, leads to a totally different structure of the of the facade. Um, it's not always uh, the case that we need or we can um, green or plant the whole wall. Uh, therefore, um, uh, this is a nice example of how to have like a punctual facade greening, uh, which allows enough space left for the balconies, uh, including um, energy production uh, by these PV panels. Uh, another nice example with the wall mounted system, um, you can see here the little holes where the plants sit in the system and uh, you can really create impressive pictures by using that. Same here. Um, 
you can imagine that um, uh, that requires a bit of maintenance and a, a very reliable irrigation system. Uh, if it works, uh, the result is really great. Again, an example where we can see it's not always the case that we cover the whole building in green. Sometimes there are only little, little spaces left, but they can add something to the building. Right, so I have um, I have reached the end of my um, of my presentation. Um, I'm sure we will have uh, a bit time in um, in the Q and A session to answer some of the questions. And uh, before we do that, um, I would like to take the opportunity, and um, it was mentioned before already, to um, to promote uh, the World Green Infrastructure Congress which will be held in Berlin in June this year. Um, because we have a really uh, big audience today and I think it's worth mentioning that. So if it's something you might be interested in, we have a two day fully packed um, conference this year in Berlin around uh, building green building infrastructure. Uh, so it's fully packed with presentations, exhibitions, networking and conference party. Uh, we show the latest from research, from industry, policy and planning. We have also one day of excursion uh, where we can visit, uh, you know, some of the most exciting green roofs and green walls in, in Berlin. Uh, we have 80 speakers there, around 50 companies exhibiting their latest products. We expect around six to 800 people from around the world, um, I think already over 300 have registered, so um, yeah, if you're interested, um, you're welcome to, to join us in Berlin in, in June this year. So I say thank you to everyone for listening, and I hand over back to Tatiana. I guess you will now open the Q&A session. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you very you much, very Stefan, much. for your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Yes, uh, we come to the Q&A uh, part. Uh, so uh, I can share my screen with Q&A slide, but uh, definitely you know that you can ask the questions in chat. Uh, yes, I, I ask our speakers to unmute yourself, turn on your cameras, because now we will talk with our participants. Yes, we have a few questions uh, for now. First one was, uh, what are the best ways to consider during making a new project to provide easy access to maintain a green wall? And thank you, Gary. I think you already answered the question. You advised to uh, to use trellis climbers, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was just uh, saying, Stefan asked the question uh, about scaffold and we, we you know, as, as, uh, as you, uh, uh, as you know, it's it's normally the case that we say trellis works uh, when we're talking about plants, but scaffold is is we understand scaffold. There's no problem with it, but we would normally say trellis. Ah, uh, so uh, but uh, if we try to find a best way to consider it during making a new project to provide an easy access to maintenance and green wall, trellis climbers also works, or it's. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry. We're 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 at cross purposes here. So I'm just saying the correct the correct English translation. Yes, yes, I understand. Trellis, but, but yes, for but maintenance, for maintenance, that's that's another question. Yeah, 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 yeah. For maintenance, so maybe we can answer this question now. So yeah. We, mm -hmm. Yeah, so for maintenance, the most common method nowadays of accessing these walls is by a. Uh, uh, what we call a cherry picker, a mobile elevated working platform, uh, because they're relatively cheap. You can hire them by the day. And in many cases, you can have them electrically powered now. Also, scissor lifts are available and they're often suitable as well. So they're very safe. Um, they're very flexible. You can reach any part of the wall. So in those situations, you, you don't need to put up scaffolding or, or anything like that. Okay, thank you, Gary. Yeah. Thank you. 
Also, we have a question from Kelly. What are the most popular plants with low maintenance? What are the most popular plants with low maintenance? Okay. Um, is, are you going to go first, Stefan, or? Yeah, again, what, what I wanted to add here is that um, it's probably not so easy to say that this is a plant with uh, very low maintenance. I think uh, an important issue is that the plant fits the system or the system fits the plant. So, um, you know, um, generally speaking, obviously, you know, low growing plants or weak growing plants um, probably need or they, they will need less maintenance than very um, aggressively on very strong growing plants. But again, if the wall is uh, and, and the system is suitable for the plant, uh, that's the most important uh, issue to avoid maintenance. So it's not just the plant species. Would you agree on that, Gary? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I'd be very cautious about recommending plants because we have potentially hundreds of species that could be used depending on the the climate, the country, the location. Um, of course, some of the climbing plants are would be considered, you know, some of the common climbing plants. Uh, like Parthenocissus and uh, Hedera would be considered low, relatively low maintenance, but of course they're not no maintenance because they do grow quickly and eventually you have to cut them because they will continue, as we saw in Stefan's slides, they will continue to grow into places where perhaps you don't want them. So, so I, I think we, we be, avoid saying low maintenance plants. Uh, if you're interested in seeing what plants are used on green walls, then some of the suppliers of green walls list the plants that they typically use. So um, if you're interested, you can send an email and we'll we'll give you the, the some links that you can check for uh, commonly used plants on green walls. But uh, it would be yes, it would take a long time to. Um, to list them all, but yes, we, we can do that. Um, send us who who was that? That was uh, 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 Kelly. That, that was yes. Kelly. Yeah, if Kelly sends an email, and then we can send some links for that. Yes, we have maybe a bit common uh, question from Tom that maybe you know any good web page to consider as the properties of plants: uh, high, low sun need, water uh, water demand, growth patterns, etc. So. Maybe we can also, if you have some ideas, what we can share, some useful materials. Yeah. You can, yes, maybe we will place the article on our website uh, with the useful links uh, regarding the topic. Uh, we will collect them and place them there. So yeah. can, if you subscribe to our uh, social media channels, we will post it there as well, and uh, you can read the answers. Yep. Yeah. OK, so we have another question. Uh, what would you consider a suitable substrate to transport water over a wall or like of like 10 meters? So imagine a vertical wall with water either on bottom or on top and then use a substrate to spread water over the wall. Any suggestions? Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll start with that one. This is this question from Tom, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. I think that Tom maybe uh, would should have a look at some of the technical drawings of how a wall bound green wall works. Um, so in general, uh, water is so the, the, the substrate or the growing medium or the horticultural um, rock wool or whatever the substrate is, is contained within modules on on an intensive green wall or a wall bound green wall. So the water does not need to be transported over large distances. So what we normally have is a reticulated irrigation system where you have a, 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 a pipe which has a series of branches on it. And each of those branches takes water to a row of modules um, so that the water just goes into that module. So a typical module might be 500 millimeters uh, deep, something like that, 400, there are various sizes. So in effect, you're only watering a relatively small area. And 
probably the, the thing for Tom to do is to look at some of the manufacturers because they have slightly different sizes, slightly different uh, techniques. But in general, it's nearly always a piped irrigation system that uh, uh, that delivers the water to where you want it to be. So 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 that's probably how best to answer that question. Um, we I did mention wicking um, and there are wicking materials that can move water around, but that's used in a very localized area. It's not over huge distances. And again, uh, manufacturers will have uh, technical drawings that you can look at and you can see how that works. So there's there's no one material um, uh, which you would choose in, in the way that's implied. Um, there are different substrates. Most of the substrates are uh, based on pumice and, and brick and, and fireproof materials that are water absorbent. So similar to green roofing technology. But as I say, there are uh, hydroponic systems that do not have substrate. They have uh, mineral wool, which uh, uh, which is used in the horticultural industry as well. So there are lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, no one answer. And again, um, probably best to look at some technical drawings uh, for that one. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, more questions about plants. What is the best suitable type of plant and sub construction to use a facet roof for energy production via PV panels and at the same time use energy efficiency increasing effect of the plants? So the plants can grow behind the panels. Stefan, are you going first? <laughs> yeah, interesting question because it's um, it's a bit a tricky one. But uh, I mean, uh, we know walls where um, PV panels and plants are combined. Um, what you typically see is that maybe on top of your facade you have a, a row of PV panels and then, you know, um, the rest of the wall is covered with green. What um, Daniel uh, obviously uh, thinks about is having a, a PV wall, a panel wall of PV panels and then uh, having the plants growing behind that. To be honest, I'm I'm not sure how good that would work if that's if that was your question, Daniel, because um, it will make it very difficult to reach the plants for maintenance. So um, they will be completely shadowed. Um, well, you might want to use semi transparent PV panels, which again, you know, might allow light to go through. But the main issue I would see here is having the plants behind the PV panels, between the panels and the wall. So um, I'm not sure whether this is uh, an idea which can be uh, built that way without issues in maintenance. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that, Stefan. I think that uh, there's very big limitations with combining PVs on on walls, but I'm sure if you really and I can't think of many examples, but I'm sure if you really wanted to, you could alternate PVs with green walls or you could, as you say, maybe have some translucent panels in, in uh, that are, are held away from the wall, but then you might have some access issues. So, yes, I'm sure with a creative team you could do something but it may not be as practical as combining pvs with vegetation as we do on roofs which is called biosolar where you you can access both the uh, plants and the pvs for maintenance and i'm particularly fond of of vertical bifacial biosolar on green roofs because you can access the green roof very easily um, and I just I just think that's an improvement over the the panels which are held at an angle. But, you know, that's roofs, that's not walls. Um, so, yes, uh, I'm sure we will see in the future some interesting architects with some interesting combinations. But uh, at the moment, um, there are some difficulties. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gary. And also we have an interesting question. How are green facet systems being viewed by building insurance and building warranty providers on new building properties and new building projects? Uh, they are asking for particular plans, system, or are not self-supporting and present in, in a result not have direct contact with building fabric? Uh, yeah, I'll go first on that. So uh, I think that question is from Scott, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. the first thing that I would say is I do not want buildings and uh, green infrastructure to be designed by insurers. I do not want an insurer to tell me what plants I should use and what systems. So, you know, I think this is a very important principle that insurers are are too cautious sometimes and it's not really their business to to dictate what we do. I know sometimes they try to do that, but I think we should always question that. So uh, that's just just something I feel strongly about because uh, people often hide behind this and say, well, we can't do something because the insurers won't allow it. Uh, that's not really the way the world should work. So uh, but having said that, yes, it is true that insurers uh, do raise questions about uh, systems and so on. But if your system meets all the codes uh, and regulations and codes of practice, then there is no reason why if it meets uh, the code of practice on fire, if it meets the structural requirements, then there is no reason why an insurer would not insure the building. And there are plenty of examples already. There are thousands of buildings in Europe and around the world which are in fully insured with all kinds of green wall systems on them. So uh, I'm not saying this would never be an issue. And at the moment in, in the UK, we have a lot of uh, questions about fire because of the Grenfell disaster. But as I say, if people are following best practice and following regulations, then there should be no problem at all with insurance. OK, thank you. Um, also, we have a question about root system of climbing plants. So we can also see examples of overgrown containers with struggling plants. Could you make some comments on this topic or point out any publications that deal with the root system of climbing plants? Um, that is something, I'm not sure <clears throat> whether you have any publications on that one, Gary. I'm not sure um, which one I could mention here. Um, what I know is that, I mean, as a general rule, um, we would uh, always recommend to have at least, uh, you know, uh, like a cubic meter of, of root uh, system, even if the plant itself wouldn't need that much uh, root space, but also to make sure enough moisture, uh, you know, can be can be stored in that uh, in that planter. Um, I'm not aware of a, of a publication where you could uh, read this for every singular or every individual plant species. So I'm afraid I'm not really able to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. I, uh, no, I, I think you're right, Stefan. I don't think there's any publications on that. I suppose there are two issues here. One is, uh, is it because the plants are are uh, getting out of their their containers? Um, I, that isn't really a problem if the containers have a root barrier. So I, I'm not sure if that's what the question is, or if it's implying that the that the that the the plants are struggling, then that's about the size of the containers. So there might be an issue with that because uh, you need enough growing medium in the container uh, to you know give the, the the plant space. So that that might be something that you know you could look at is having adequate size of container. Uh, but then of course even if a, a plant is root bound, it can still grow if it's watered and there's fer fertilizer applied. So I'm not quite sure about that question. Um, if you want to, if that's, is that Branislav again? Yeah. If you want to send a, a more detailed question by email, then we could have a look at that. Um, sorry not to be more helpful uh, at this moment. And also we have a question, how often should a vegetated facades be renovated or renewed? Uh, you mentioned the quite 
d'Orsay wall in Paris, uh, Paris uh, for example, where yep. the structure had uh, rebuilt the plants, uh, replaced, renewed 15 years after the construction? Well, you know, this really depends on what the green facade is, doesn't it? So the the Madeira Drive green wall in Brighton is 150 years old and it has never been replaced and it's only being repaired now. So so for that kind of approach, uh, 100 years is, is a perfectly feasible uh, design life. Um, the Patrick Blanc, uh, the first wave of Patrick Blanc walls were experimental in some ways. They were pioneering. And so I would say that now uh, the modular systems that are on the market, especially some of the metal ones that we're seeing from Austria and Germany, would last a lot longer than that. And they would have design life of 50 years at least. Um, however, um, uh, it depends what you mean by renewal, because any green wall will have some plants that fail. And we always recommend that people plan to replace some of the plants during routine maintenance. So um, it's not really a, que a, a question of you plant the wall and then you wait 15 years. You probably replace some of the plants on on a, a wall bound system every year, maybe five percent, something like that. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's uh, 15 years actually was very good considering it was a pioneering system. Uh, now we can we can definitely design walls that last much longer than that. And as I say, it, uh, in the 19th century, they already uh, had walls that, that that were designed and planted that lasted more than 100 years. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a question. How does a green facade compare to a green roof in terms of water storage? Are you going to go first, uh, Stefan? Yeah, yeah okay. uh, that uh, depends a lot on the system you're using, on, on the way you are um, greening the wall. Um, if you have a wall mounted system or I, I call it a panel system, um, you um, you have quite a lot of water storage per square meter because they are usually constantly uh, watered and have a certain water storage capacity. Uh, also, of course, it depends really on um, uh, on the, the plant, uh, the plants you're using. Um, you will probably it depends a bit on also what you mean by water storage i mean the green wall will um a uh, panel system will normally be irrigated so you pump water onto the wall where it's then stored for a limited time but then uh, moves downwards it's then pumped up again um while on a green roof on a, on a uh, you, you would usually um or if a non-irrigated green roof um uh, you will have the rainwater that is stored on the system and then runs off the roof and it's not pumped up again. Um, generally speaking, I would think that a green roof has probably more water storage per square meter than most of the green wall systems. Um, yeah, but depends really on what uh, what type of system you're using, whether it's a panel system or whether it's a, it's a ground bound uh, planting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, we have a question uh, regarding Gary's presentation. You mentioned a wall that was passive and didn't have any pumps, but worked really well. Where was that and what it is the name of the building? Uh, yes, so it's it's on a uh, uh, a public housing project in Tooley Street in London. So you can search for vertical rain garden Tooley Street and you'll find uh, uh, several uh, articles about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you'll find that easily enough. OK, thank you. And uh, are there any official rules, guidelines for specifically maybe I, uh, I saw for green walls in England? Uh, no, no, uh, there's there's no um, uh, there's no real official guidance there but of course there are building regulations that we have so we need to to meet with those uh, but i see that elizabeth has typed in the uh 
in the uh, in the chat that the, in, in Austria there's uh, there's some standards for vertical outdoor greening. So that's that will be very useful for people to have a look at. Thank you. Yes, I also love the discussion in chat. <laughs> there, are, there are experts exchanging opinions as well. Uh, so, do you have experience with vertical gardens in in climates where which uh, go negative degrees in winter? Uh, yes, of course. Um, Vienna um, uh, is a good example. You know, we used to back 20 years ago when we used to get inquiries from Moscow, they always said it's impossible to do this in Moscow because it's much colder than England. But actually, there are examples now in Russia, in Canada, in Ukraine, in Poland. Uh, uh, of course, Central Europe can be very cold. In Sweden and Finland, there are green walls. So there's no question of green walls working in, in cold climates and, and also in hot climates. But, you know, in the in places like Saudi Arabia, we recommend that they use sun shading at the uh, above the wall so that the plants have more of a chance because irrigation isn't enough on its own sometimes the plants are damaged by the solar radiation so so maybe going back to the question about pvs and green walls somewhere that's very sunny i think that would be a good idea that you use a, a pv as your shade at the top of the wall and then that means the plants have more of a chance and arguably in south facing facades in temperate countries uh, like Central Europe, having a, a sunshade of a PV at the top of the wall might actually work quite well with south facing facades. So, you know, I think that's quite a good idea that's come out of that conversation. OK, so also we have a question which you, Gary, I think already answered in chat, but maybe we can also check it loud that um, um, about wall bounded green facades and whether the positive outweight of the difficulty of maintenance and water and fertilizer consumption. So the uh, what are the benefits more than um, maintenance uh, time? Yeah, yeah. So um, so obviously the wall bound systems need much more money to maintain them because you need to hire technicians who will be in access equipment which you have to pay for and it there it's very common to have several visits a year to these wall bound installations so it may cost several thousand euros a year to look after a large intensive wall bound green uh, wall so uh, clearly if the budget for maintenance on a building is limited then it doesn't really make sense to do that and you would be looking at um, uh, climbing plants on trellis works which do not require as, as much mate they still require maintenance but not as much now in terms of irrigation and fertilizers it's actually not that difficult to water and, and uh, add fertilizers to uh, a, a wall band system because it's done automatically. Um, as, as we've said, there's a reticulated system, it's computer controlled, it can be monitored by app, you can see from your phone, um, and fertilizers are added to the uh, irrigation as required by, by equipment uh, which just injects that fertilizer into the water. So that's very, very simple. It's not a difficult thing to do. What is more costly is cutting and replanting because some technician will have to be in that uh, in that basket uh, of, of the hoist to do that. So uh, so it's a reasonable question. It's not always suitable to do this. Some buildings don't have the budget for it. Um, sometimes it's not the right location. So it's one of those fundamental questions you need to ask at the beginning. Is this the most appropriate thing to do? And that is why these wall bound systems tend to be uh, used on high profile buildings, government buildings, um, hotels and so on, because they have the, the budget to do that. Maybe buildings which which are important uh, visually in the city. But I predict that in the future, uh, uh, large uh, housing developments will more and more have greening because the cost of maintenance will come down. 
Um, uh, I was in Brazil talking to people there and they're talking about using drones to maintain and robots to maintain green walls on tall buildings. Uh, you know, they had this idea of a sloth robot that climbs up and down the wall, maintaining it. Uh, and you can imagine that the cost of using a robot to do that would be much cheaper. So, you know, I, I think the cost will come down um, and there will be more and more buildings with these green walls, with the increasing temperatures uh, that we're experiencing and the evaporative cooling that we'll be getting from that. And that means that the cost of the water for irrigation will be money well spent. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, last, I think, answer, because I think we run to the end of our webinar today. I will show one more slide with thank you to our, first of all, our speakers today. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us today and for your great contribution to this knowledge uh, spread over the Europe of your experience and knowledge. And we also want to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Walgreen, Vertis Bino Witness, Karlstahl, Jakob Probe Systems and Dachkun, who supported our webinar today and made it accessible for all people for free. So we remind you that we are recording this webinar. It will be available offline. Uh, in uh, It will be available on our YouTube channel. We will share it one more time in uh, chat uh, so please uh, subscribe and we will and we will inform you uh, when it's there and one funny notice at the end uh, we found out that today is a world green uh, wall day <laughs> so basically our webinar is really um, looks like it's dedicated to it but it was uh, coincidence and uh, it's very nice to know that uh, we celebrated is it in such a way all together thank you all the participants for joining us today for finding time for us and uh, hope to uh, stay connected and uh, do more future projects uh, connected to webinars and so on in the future thank you thank you gary thank you stefan thank you everybody and uh, yes uh, write us Follow us and we will communicate in the future more. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye.